Hi, I'm Jeff Hajek, the owner and founder of Election. This video is part of my lean training system. It was originally released as a DVD a long time ago, but times have changed and the look of some of these LTS videos is now a bit dated. The content is still spot on though. So rather than just discontinue the line, I am posting the majority of each of the 36 videos here with the remainder available at Velaction Videos. That's our video service where you can download a wealth of supporting content and watch subscriber only videos. I recommend subscribing and hitting the notification button if you want to make sure you don't miss any new content. I would also really appreciate if you would hit the like button if this video is helpful and you want to see more content similar to it. The like button helps us get found on YouTube, but it also lets us figure out where you want us to put our future effort. Now enjoy the free version of this video. Welcome to Velaction Continuous Improvement's presentation about 5S and visual management. This DVD is part of our Lean Training System, so there is a lot of companion information available on our website at www.velaction.com. Some of it is premium, but there is also a lot of free supporting content that can help you get more out of the video you are about to watch. I am Jeff Hajek, the owner and founder of the company and the award-winning author of What Do You Mean I Gotta Be Lean? Thanks in advance for watching. In this presentation, you will learn how to create an effective workspace through the use of 5S principles, and about the benefit of using visual controls to help make decisions when managing your process. So a good place to start is to jump right into things and explain what 5S is and what the 5S's are. 5S is basically a philosophy about creating a workspace that supports your processes. Not surprisingly, there are 5S terms that are used to help remember the parts of the system. Sorting is getting rid of unnecessary clutter. Straightening is finding homes for everything. Scrubbing is making the workplace spotless as well as making it easy to keep clean. Standardizing is locking all the locations in place. And finally, the hardest of the S's, sustaining. Before I move on to the next slide, I want to draw your attention to the SG2 icon in the upper left of the screen. As I mentioned in the introduction, this DVD is part of our Lean Training System, which includes student guides. If you have one, the icons are a convenient way to synchronize it with this DVD. A quick way to describe 5S is that it is a place for everything and everything in its place. While that's a good summary of what 5S is, it hardly scratches the surface of why you should focus on adding the philosophy to your workspace. So why is 5S promoted as one of the cornerstones of an effective lean culture? First of all, it has proven its effectiveness. A well-organized work area supports a process better than a cluttered one. It takes less time to do work because there is not as much searching and there are shorter distances to the most commonly used items. It also means better quality as clutter and dirt don't affect processes. Second, people can work together better. Because the work area is standardized, anyone can step in and know exactly where things go. If you have ever had to fill in for an absent coworker or had someone fill in for you, you know the impact that migrating tools can have on a process. But in lean organizations, the mobility is not just limited to absences. Teams have to be flexible. Job rotation is common when production is adjusted to meet changing demand. Plus, good lean managers move people around to keep them sharp and prevent boredom, as well as to get fresh eyes on processes to speed up improvements. Cross-training is much easier when a work area is standardized. 5S also makes a good first impression. Obviously, customers like to see an organized, clean workplace. You probably make assessments yourself about the quality of an organization when you go into stores or restaurants or hire professionals like plumbers. Organization is an indicator of effectiveness. But as an employee, it is not only customers that you need to impress. You also may have bankers or potential investors coming through. Would you have a good feeling about giving money to a company that looked chaotic and disorganized? And consider new hires. If you want to get the cream of the crop of new coworkers, you have to show them that they won't be struggling if they take a job working with you. If they see you scrambling to find parts or tools or files, when they tour their potential new work area, they may hold out for a different offer. And finally, 5S reduces stress. Think about how you feel when you go to find a tool and it is not where you thought it was, or someone borrows something and puts it back in the wrong location. Now think about when those things happen if you're on a tight deadline or if you have an angry customer on the phone. Not having the right tools right when you need them can spike your blood pressure. Now that we have a better understanding of what you can get from 5S, 
Let's talk a bit about the background of the philosophy. While workplace organization has been around for a long time, the specific concept of 5S comes out of Toyota's early improvement efforts. Many of the lean practices that Toyota has used over the years to great success rely on 5S to function properly. And obviously, because Toyota is a Japanese company, it makes sense that the original terms were in Japanese. Unfortunately, translation is not an exact science, and it gets even more imprecise when you are limited to words that start with the letter S. As a result, there are many more than five S terms floating around the lean community. The five that Velaction uses are just one possible combination. You are likely to see many other mix and match configurations from the column at the right. Don't get wrapped around the axle about using a specific set of terms, though, especially if you change jobs and end up somewhere that uses a different group than you are used to. Just keep the underlying principles in mind, and you'll still make good progress. I hope you are getting something valuable out of this video. If you want to get more out of this program, we recommend watching it on Velaction videos. You'll be able to watch the entire video, mostly ad-free, and view subscriber-only programs. You'll also have access to a load of continuous improvement downloads. Let's talk now about the terms in some more detail. The first one is sort. It is the act of getting all the clutter out of your work area, separating the necessary from the unnecessary. Think of layers when you sort, something like an onion. The items closest to you should be the ones you use most frequently. The things near you, but out of arm's reach or in drawers, should be the stuff that you use less frequently. And the items you seldom use should be moved another layer out to a central location. By the way, I'm not a big fan of drawers in production areas. They seldom hold items that can't be stored at the point of use, and often become a collection point for clutter. I have several rules of thumb for deciding if something is needed or not. First, if you don't remember something even being in your work area, move it out. This often happens with items that are stored in those drawers that I don't like or in cabinets. Likewise, if you can't remember what an object is used for, or if you can't even identify what it is, take that as a good indicator that it's not needed. Layers of dust also indicate that an item could probably be moved out without affecting production. And even if none of these other tests apply, consider whether you are likely to use the item in the next 30 days. If you don't think you will, move it out. Now, saying move it out is far easier than actually moving something out. Sorting can present a significant emotional and psychological hurdle to some people. The underlying issue is fair. People are scared that they will get rid of something that they need, and it will make their jobs harder down the road. But in many cases, this fear is grossly overblown. Consider, for example, old manuals. I suspect that there will be good reasons to keep archives of old documentation, but you probably don't need them scattered around the company, and you certainly don't need them stashed in a corner. The fact is, if you have items stored like they are in this picture, you'd probably never find them when they are needed anyway. Unless there is a really good reason to keep something, get rid of it. If the items are of no value to anyone else, put a dumpster to good use. As a side note, in this pile were several boxes of five and a quarter inch floppy disks, and this picture was taken about 15 years after the three and a half inch disk drive came out. It is surprising how long unnecessary items can take up space. But you will come across some items that do have value, possibly just not to you. Or you will have a big stash of supplies that you do use, just more than you would need in the near future. Those items should be moved out of your immediate work area. You want the items nearest you to be the things that are most critical to your process. Again, think layers. The less likely you are to need something in the near future, the further it should be away from you. You generally have two options here. The first is to move the items to a central, well-organized storage area. The other option is a red tag area. Now, as I have mentioned, there is a lot of emotion involved in a sorting step. One way to combat the bad feelings is to use red tags. A red tag is simply a visual indicator that helps determine if an item is needed or not. The process is rather simple. Start off by identifying any item that you don't think is needed. In most cases, the thing in question will not have a permanent marked location. The next step is to tag the item. There are commercially available red tags with wire twists, or you can make your own such as I did here. Either way, the red tag does the same thing. It calls attention to an item and asks people to confirm whether it is needed or not. Note that the tag I made is simple. Most commercially available ones are more detailed. The key is to make sure that the information on the tag matches your red tag process or it will create confusion. 
Obviously, you wouldn't need to red tag an item if you were the only person who worked in an area, but it is a good practice to do whenever a space is shared. After tagging the item, leave it in the work area for review. Your red tag process should specify how long the review period is. The point of the red tag is to call attention to the item and give people a chance to claim it. The red tag acts as a visual that shows immediately that somebody is questioning whether they should get rid of the piece of equipment. If, in fact, you do need the item, there's a fee for keeping it, though. You have to find and mark a permanent home for it. We'll detail how to go about doing that later in the standardization step. If you don't need the item, simply do nothing. After the disposition date marked on a tag is reached, the item should be removed from the work area. You'll need a process that clearly defines who is responsible for making this happen in a timely manner. At this point, you may be wondering what happens to all of the items that you pull out of your work area after they are red tagged. Obviously, many of them will still have value to someone else, so they should not just go into a dumpster. If the item is needed for the process, but only once in a while, it should be moved to a central location. This would include things like replacement printer cartridges or equipment used for monthly testing and production tools. If the items are not used by you but still have value, they should go to the red tag area. The red tag area is basically an organized swap meet. Because everyone in the company knows about the centralized red tag area, there's a constant flow of items in and out. One key that many companies miss, though, is that the red tag area must be managed well. If it isn't, it will quickly become a dumping ground. Red tag areas should be organized, and they should be reviewed so that stagnant items don't sit taking up space for years. And, of course, some items will have no value to the company and must be disposed of. Many of these things will end up as scrap, but sometimes the item will be of use to a person outside of your organization and can be sold or even given away to employees. As part of the Lean training system this video comes from, we offer a variety of Lean LEGO training packages. These include our Lean LEGO flow simulation, mistake-proofing or pokey oak Lean LEGO exercise, and our visual controls and 5S Lean LEGO exercise. We've also got an office flow simulation for those not implementing continuous improvement on the shop floor. Click the links in the description below or click on cards that pop up on this video to learn more. We'll also add links at the end. Once you have all of the clutter removed from your work area, it's time to get it organized. Because you have fewer things left in the area after your red tagging efforts, the straightening step becomes easier. If you still had all the extra items, you'd have to find homes for those things as well. And that's what straightening is all about finding permanent locations for everything you need to do your job. Obviously, that improves your efficiency greatly because you never need to look for items, but it can also improve the quality of your work. You don't try to make do with replacement tools, and you don't have loads of junk invading your work area, which can lead to mistakes. So to find those homes, first think about usage. The most frequent items should be closest to you, with the occasional items at that outer layer of the onion that I mentioned earlier. You can also add some sophistication to your 5S by matching the sequence of items to your process and organizing the layout so it is easy to grab two tools at once, one with each hand. For example, you could do this when using a ratchet and a wrench to tighten some hardware, or you could grab a part with one hand and a tool with the other. You should also focus on making items visible. That means avoiding storage that hides things such as drawers and cabinets. If you must use them, make sure that the interiors are also well 5S. The straightening step should be looked at as a chance to get creative in where you put your items. Instead of using off-the-shelf or catalog solutions, think about how you'd like the tool oriented to make it easy to grab. Don't think about what to use to hold a tool at this point. Just think about how you would like the tool positioned to make it as easy and quick to use as possible. Then come up with an idea on how to store the tool in that orientation. I often refer to this as the handshake you should be able to reach out and grab a tool as if you are shaking hands with it. I also challenge teams to be able to put the tool away five times in a row with their eyes closed. If they can do that, the tool will be a breeze to grab and put away during live production. And don't just limit your 5S to physical items. Organize your computer using the same principles. One trick I've seen used effectively. Make an image with set locations on it to use as your desktop wallpaper. That way, you'll have a specific place to put anything you need and you won't have to search through a bunch of files to find what you're looking for. One final point. 
When you are doing a serious overhaul on your work area's organization, you will probably have to move a lot of equipment and work surfaces around. Don't let your thinking get constrained by where desks, benches, shelving, and fixtures are now. Think of a good process and make your permanent locations match it, never the other way around. So what does the straightened area look like? It is generally well laid out with the parts and tools at the point of use. Of note, in this picture the tags are straightened but not necessarily locked in place. It doesn't look like the spaces are labeled and there is nothing to orient the user to where things are. Despite the appearance of organization, it might still be hard to use this work area. We'll address that in a standardized step. So let's talk about what can go wrong in these first two steps. In general, mistakes early in a process are worse than ones later. The early ones, if undetected, get compounded along the way and continue to add cost at each subsequent step. The 5S process is no different. Mistakes in sorting and straightening can add more work down the road. So here are a few things to watch out for. I am generally against using shadow boards in production areas. They make tools hard to get out and put away because of the orientation of the hooks and rings, and they cause tools to be batched together, which result in suboptimal locations. Using standard benches is another problem. Many processes don't require a full 6 or 8 foot workbench. Consider building your own work surfaces, or at least get rid of the fear of modifying the benches you do have. Another failing is that people often neglect to test changes in production environments. Some locations look good in theory, but don't work as well when a process is being run at full speed. Test before locking things in. Consensus is also important for a team. It helps for two reasons. The first is that people take more ownership, so they don't feel like 5S is being forced upon them. The second is that you may have people with various body types in a work area. You don't want tall people crouching down or height impaired people having to stretch to get items. Finally, a big problem results when the sort step is not done thoroughly enough. It follows that the fewer items and parts you have to find homes for, the easier the task will be. But having homes for all of your equipment, parts, file, and supplies is only part of 5S. There is also a need to keep the now organized area clean. Actually, it would be better to say that the requirement is not only to clean the area, but to keep it clean. One of the big reasons for this emphasis on keeping an area spick and span is that a clean workspace makes problems jump out at you. Think of where it would be easier to identify if your car was leaking oil. If you live in a city or an apartment and share spaces with other cars, you will probably be parking over a rather large oil slick. Any new drops would be very hard to see. On the other hand, if you park in your own garage and you keep it clean, you will probably notice oil drips much more easily, and that rapid recognition can translate into avoiding a costly repair. But there is much more to 5S than just cleaning. There is also a need to make it easy to keep areas clean, or better yet, to prevent dirt in the first place. Think of the trend in hotel rooms. Most that I have stayed at in recent years offer small packets of coffee that you just drop into the coffee maker. In the old days, you were likely to see a pouch you had to tear open and pour into a filter. The new method prevents messes. I am confident that on any given day with hundreds of hotel rooms, the housekeeping staff used to spend a fair amount of time cleaning up grounds. With these new packets, they probably spend very little time wiping up stray grounds. Another way you can make things easy to clean is to bundle cables. Actually, a better way is to eliminate them by going wireless when possible, but in the absence of that option, get them all bundled up so there is no place for dust to hide. So let's take a look at a few more examples of making things easy to clean. In this image, the hoses were bundled together to keep debris from getting between them and rubbing as the hoses pulsed. The routing also makes it easy to get a mop between a coolant tank and the CNC machine. You'll also notice the tray the pump unit sits in. It keeps any drips and spills from spreading, but that is really just a treatment of a symptom. A better method would be to find where the fluid comes from and prevent it altogether. This image shows good progress, but is still far from world class. There is a better option that goes beyond just making cleanup easier. You can prevent dirt from ever getting into hard to clean areas in the first place. In this picture, the weather stripping was added below a turntable to keep shavings and debris from getting under the machine. But when you get really good at lean, even this won't be enough for you. You'll start questioning whether you can attack dirt even closer to its source. Perhaps smaller stock or a part redesign will reduce the quantity of metal shavings, or some sort of vacuum system will keep the debris from flying around. 
Once you learn the principles of 5S and see the benefits, you'll find yourself looking for new, creative ways to prevent dirt in the first place. Unfortunately, though, the battle against dirt and clutter faces a formidable foe in the form of a disease that afflicts many people. Flat surface syndrome creates an urge to lay random stuff on any flat surface. Look around the typical office or factory. Open space simply attracts piles and piles of clutter. The interesting thing is that people can keep an area clear for only so long. But when the first item gets placed on a pristine surface, others seem to magically and instantly appear. Once the clutter barrier is broken, the resistance to keep from filling the space vanishes. The best way to battle FSS is to avoid flat surfaces in the first place. Make the size of the workspace fit the process. Remember earlier when I talked about common 5S problems? Using large standard workbenches tends to add more flat surfaces than you need. Use custom, right-sized benches when possible. In my war on flat surfaces, I've even gone so far as to make cardboard tents to fit over the top of cabinets. That physical barrier keeps people from putting items there. If you need something, it should have a designated location. So now, you have a clean, organized workplace. You want it to stay that way, right? To do that, you have to lock in the locations that you just set up. As you do this, you'll want to make the locations jump out at you. But it is not just where to put things that should be apparent. You should also immediately know when something is missing. This helps keep you from running into situations where you go to reach for something and it's not there. When that happens, flow is disrupted and production is delayed. In a lean organization, there is often very little buffer time and processes are tightly connected. Little delays get amplified and affect numerous people. Good 5S helps avoid these hiccups. I will caution you here about something. As you start standardizing and labeling, only make things as pretty and neat as the situation demands. If you are a customer-oriented retail shop, everything should be perfect. But if you are on a shop floor, you don't need fancy. You need effective. And you need flexible. Pretty takes a lot of time. People become unwilling to switch things up, even if there is a benefit, when the cost of redoing the window dressing is high. To be clear, I am not saying that haphazard is okay. I am saying that you don't need to spend a lot of time making things perfect. Another common problem is going to extremes on the labeling. What is this item? Do you have more information now? The point is that some people confuse 5S with labeling everything. While labeling is a big part of 5S, it has to serve a purpose. In this case, it just wasted your time and a small piece of label. But when there is a purpose, by all means label or mark items in other ways. A common bookshelf marking system is the use of a diagonal strip of tape. When a manual is out of place, the broken line leaps off the shelf at you. You could tell from 10 feet away that something is wrong, even if you had never seen the shelf before. Let's take a look at a few more examples of standardization. This tooling area works well for maintenance, but would not be great for production. All the tools are organized by size and shape, not by where they are needed. You can, though, immediately see what is missing, even though this picture was taken from several yards away. The shadow board is an example of what I was talking about earlier when I said 5S only has to be as pretty as needed. Notice that the outlines are simply drawn on behind the tools. I would like to remind you of some of this shadow board's shortcomings. Note how hard it would be to put the screwdrivers back into the double rings, or how you would have to flip the wrench around to use it. Little things that consume small amounts of time add up when they are done a lot. You'll also notice that because the rings were bought off the shelf, all the screwdrivers have to be stored together, even though that is not the sequence they are used in. The crimping and banding tools, though, are located together, which is nice. One word of advice you will always be able to find things to improve on. Even though the shadow board has some weaknesses, it is still better than having tools strewn about. And that standardization gives a good foundation for further improvement. Of course, 5S is not only for the shop floor. In this image, some basic office tools are located on a shelf in a common printer area. Note, though, that the items are just labeled. An image will be better, but again, don't forget that there is progress here. The labeling and designating of locations for the office equipment is a positive step. There is another problem with this area, though. I want you to think for a moment about cleaning it up. You'd have to move each of the items out of the way to wipe up dust. Think about the cleanup of an area before you commit to putting tools on a flat surface like this. 
After standardization, you should pretty much have your work area clean and organized, and it should be humming along. But the challenge is keeping it that way. Sustaining, the last step of 5S, is also the hardest. It doesn't take much effort to carve out a few minutes, or even half a day, to get an area shipshape in the first place. It does, though, require a lot of work to keep from backsliding. It might seem easier in a short term to leave things out when work gets chaotic, but in the long term, it can be very hard to get back on track once you let things start to slide. Good self-discipline is the first line of defense in maintaining 5S. A common method used to keep things from getting out of control is the audit. It can be self-audits, informal leader walkthroughs, or formal audits by the boss. But the truth is that audits are really just treatments of symptoms. The most effective 5S comes when there's a cultural shift in a company. When people recognize the benefit of keeping up with 5S, it is much easier to maintain. In fact, good 5S becomes preferable to any alternative. You'll know you've got your 5S right when items are easier to put away than they are to leave out. How many people keep their forks and spoons and knives jumbled together like this? Not many. I have yet to enter a house that did not have an organized silverware drawer. And I never once saw an audit sheet posted that checked if the forks were in the spoon slot. People put flatware away in the proper locations because it makes sense to do it. So that wraps up what 5S is. But to get it running effectively, you need to have a few things in place. The first is leadership. 5S requires planning, mentoring, training, and a whole lot more. In short, if a leader wants a team to commit to 5S, she will have to put in a lot of work. But the biggest thing the leader needs to do is set the example. Not only does this mean keeping her own workspace organized, but it means being diligent in enforcing 5S standards. Leaders who walk by obvious problems are not setting a good example. Having a culture of improvement also helps. If you don't already have a strong one in place though, don't worry. 5S is part of a positive cycle. Good 5S improves a culture, which in turn makes 5S easier. Another thing that makes 5S less challenging is to build skills in employees. Watching this DVD is a good first step, but it will take a lot of practice to really hone a team's 5S skills. And that doesn't even touch on the need to learn all those artsy craftsy things that 5Sers need to do. Another thing to consider is the cost of 5S. Employees need a variety of tools to make custom storage methods. Tape and label makers and Velcro all cost money. There is an initial expense to get the equipment, and then a recurring expense for consumables. And finally, you have to put the right systems in place. I talked earlier about the red tag process. That's a system, as is the numbering convention for shelves, and the color coding for walkways or product lines. Systems help keep things consistent across the organization, and help teams work together. Plus, systems keep teams from spending their limited improvement time reinventing the wheel. Let's talk in a little more detail about the skills you need for effective 5S. First of all, a lot of 5S activity requires computers. Labeling shelving can be done with a label maker, but often an Excel spreadsheet and a mail merge can be more effective when lots of labels are required. You'll also need big tags, color coding keys, and you might even choose to print digital pictures to show what goes in a specific location. All of this work requires some skill with a variety of software. In addition to the information side of 5S, you will need to be able to build stuff. It can be as simple as a conical hole in a piece of wood to hold a screwdriver, or it can be a specially fabricated gadget that swings a rack of parts closer to your work area. In both cases, you need someone with the right skills to work with the medium of your choice. But neither of the preceding skills matters much if you can't come up with new ideas. Fortunately, creativity can be learned, but it takes practice you are not going to come up with great ideas the first few times out. You'll have a couple of missteps along the way. And unfortunately, that plays right into the biggest obstacle to creativity, a fear of failure. Whether the fear comes from people thinking their job is at risk, or if it is about thinking they will look silly in front of coworkers doesn't really matter. Fear limits creativity either way. But you can get past that hurdle as you try things and get a better sense of what does and doesn't work. Start with low-risk ideas, and you'll slowly but surely expand your creative range. Overcoming any reluctance you might have to take creative risk is essential to getting better at 5S. 
Get more out of our Lean Training System videos with our Continuous Improvement Companion. It's closing in on a thousand pages of great content. It is currently available as a download with a subscription to Vlaction Videos and as a license through our store. You can also get a free version of it by signing up for our newsletter. Click the links in the description below or click on the cards that pop up on this video to learn more. We'll also add links at the end. Of course, knowing what to do is only part of the challenge with 5S. You also have to have the right tools and materials for the job. Obviously, you want to have the equipment teams need to do effective 5S readily available. But I recommend that leaders provide multiple sets of equipment. Why? Because when there's a problem with production and the line stops for more than a few minutes, 5S is a good go-to type of project. The problem though is that when the line stops, everyone will be having the same thoughts and there won't be enough equipment to go around. A few hundred bucks of extra equipment will pay for itself very quickly. Who knows, you might even be able to find some of the things you need for free in the red tag area. By the way, when I am coaching frontline leaders, I tell them to make sure their teams know exactly what to do when they have some downtime. In an empowered workforce, the employees should have a lot of say in the project, but leaders will still have the responsibility to make sure that the proper tools and materials are available. Of course, while you need redundancy, you probably don't want each and every work area to have to maintain its own 5S station. Not every part of the company stops at the same time. So having a few central 5S locations will help keep costs in check and it will let you make sure that each one is properly equipped. Be creative in what you put into your 5S kits. Stocking a wide variety of materials gives employees more flexibility in getting their areas 5S. Just keep in mind that there should be a system for maintaining inventory or people will start creating hidden stockpiles of their own, negating the benefit of the central location. There's that word again, system. Having a system is not only important for the 5S stations though, it is also required for many other parts of 5S. For example, 5S should be integrated into the Kaizen process. Audits should address 5S, training should cover 5S, and facilitators should make sure that 5S is considered whenever a new process is developed. By the way, some people advocate doing 5S Kaizens. I'm not a big fan of that. I think that 5S should be done in conjunction with process improvement. If you just do a 5S event, you are merely locking in the status quo. It isn't much more effort to just do a full process improvement project and make sure that one of the deliverables is a well-organized work area. I already mentioned that red tag areas need a system. Again, the intent is not to create a place to dump trash. The items should be useful. With no process, clutter, ironically, starts to accumulate in the red tag area. Finally, when you start doing 5S vigorously, you will identify a requirement to develop several processes. Obviously, you'll need a training process to get people up to speed, and you'll need to bring new hires on board. But you'll also, at some point, want standard conventions. You don't want employees having to relearn the color coding for floor markings every time they walk from one department to another. And you don't want the location marking format on shelving units to differ from building to building. As you see the need, avoid the urge to haphazardly create visuals. Make a master plan. So, where do you get started? Well first, establish the systems I mentioned. Get a red tag area prepared and create standards for marking floors, defective parts, material locations, and the like. These sorts of systems will accelerate your progress. And once the systems are in place, the team should be trained. That means everyone. 5S is universal. Most initial 5S activities will happen during Kaizen events. That's because it is a good place for mentors to show team members what to do. As people gain experience, they can start doing more 5S during daily improvement when they are on their own. In either case though, 5S should be closely linked to the process that it is supporting. And finally, the last step is to keep from regressing. It is easy to backslide if you are not diligent about locking your gains in. For most companies that are early in their lean journey, that means an audit program. As I mentioned earlier, when 5S really hits the mark, it does not need an audit. It creates a clear advantage to put things back in their proper place. But unfortunately, not every single 5S effort will fall into that category. Some of the gains are subtle, so the desire to take shortcuts especially in times of stress, won't be completely eliminated. In those cases, a morning self-audit can help make sure that each day starts with things where they're supposed to be. 
Keep in mind that a self-audit should not be extensive. It also is not intended to determine how good the 5S is in the area. It is only to determine if the current 5S is being followed. There is also a big benefit to having leaders walk through the work area before every shift starts. This focus and attention to detail sends the message that 5S is important. And since 5S is an integral part of a continuous improvement culture, it also helps develop an organization with a commitment to get better. Finally, many companies use a formal 5S auditing process. I'm a fan of using these when an organization is first starting out or when it's showing decay in its adherence to 5S principles. I suggest doing formal audits on a regular schedule in these situations. That repetitive nature lets you evaluate progress over time. Once a group understands 5S though and commits to it and gets their work to a state of highly refined organization, formal audits don't add much to the other two methods. Obviously, you don't need to audit things that are easy to do. So where do the challenges come from in 5S? Well, the first problem is that 5S can feel reminiscent of parents telling kids to go clean up their rooms. Adults tend to not like that feeling of being treated like children, so they resist. There is also the challenge of getting 5S up and running. As I mentioned, it needs systems in place to work at peak effectiveness, and that costs in terms of both time and money. 5S is not easy, which can be a deterrent. 5S can also be hard to maintain, especially when a company is just getting started with Lean. At that point, things are often still chaotic, and teams tend to be grossly understaffed. That means the effort that is required to make 5S stick can raise stress initially, even if it will ultimately make jobs easier. So why do people abandon 5S when things get hectic? Because they often abandon their standard process and take shortcuts. That means that the 5S is no longer matched to what a person is doing and can actually make a job harder. The final challenge I'll be discussing is 5S implementation in common areas. Often, the person responsible for the location resents when other people mess up the area, which makes them less committed to keeping things in order. Or worse, there is no person who owns the area, so nobody takes responsibility for maintaining it. There is also the challenge of determining which process to match the 5S to. When multiple people share an area, several processes can overlap. This video comes from Volaction's Lean Training System, which takes a module-based approach to learning about continuous improvement. Modules include a PowerPoint presentation and student guides for every video, plus there are many exercises and quizzes as well. There's also a whole host of supporting content in the form of terms in our Continuous Improvement Companion and downloadable articles. Our modules are currently available in our store and as downloads at Volaction Videos. Click the links in the description below or click on the cards that pop up on this video to learn more. We'll also add links at the end. But once you overcome those barriers and get good 5S in place, it's time to move on to implementing visual controls. Essentially, visual controls make the status of a process jump out at you and help you choose a course of action. Think of it this way. 5S makes a process easier to do. Visual controls makes a process easier to manage. You'll find, though, that 5S and visual controls share many of the same characteristics. Both require standardization, organization, and clear markings. You are very likely already familiar with visual controls. A stoplight is a good example of one. Do you know what to do when you see a light turn red? Do you have to pull out a manual and check what it means? Or do you have to get your slide rule out and do some higher order math? No, the action is intuitive. The stoplight, in fact, presents a great example of the characteristics of visual controls. First of all, the current condition is easy to see. A yellow light, for example, means that the light will be changing soon, and a green light means that the cross traffic will be stopped. In this case, the standard is green. When the light is green, we continue as normal. But when the light turns yellow or red, we know something is out of the ordinary. An abnormal condition is present. And when there is an abnormal condition, the visual control should link to an action. For the stoplight, the red light means we should stop. So with those criteria in mind, do you think that this is a good example of a visual control? Let's look at it first from a customer perspective. Does it show a standard? Yes, it is clear which line is which. 
In fact, it meets my 10-foot, 3-second rule. You should be able to assess a visual control within 3 seconds from 10 feet away. If you always try to do that, you'll avoid a lot of confusion. As for the next question, does it link to an action? Yes, a person entering the line is able to easily choose a side based on the ticket they hold. And finally, does it show the current condition? In this case, the answer is no. The passenger has no way of knowing if the length of line is normal or not. Compare this line to the lines at theme parks. Many have signs that tell you how long you will be in the queue. In those cases, the current condition is apparent. But customers are not the only people to consider here. We also have to think about whether this visual works for an employee of the airline. So let's look at it with the same conditions in mind. First, does it show the standard? Again, as with the passenger, the answer is yes. An employee can tell the type of ticket a person has by the line the passenger is in. Is the current condition obvious? Well, from the information available, we really can't tell. The sign might be positioned at the dividing line between normal length and excessively long for a single agent to handle, but we really don't know for sure. And as for the last question, does it link to an action? Again, we cannot tell. We simply don't know if there is a procedure or an SOP that says what to do when the abnormal condition is identified. So this visual is not perfect, but it certainly is better than nothing, and it provides a good foundation to improve upon later. And that concept leads me to an important point I would like to stress. Keep this in mind as you progress on your lean journey. Improvement is never done. Projects might be completed, but there will always be another project. There will always be more ways to improve. I encourage you to stay upbeat. Focus on the successes. Obviously, you have to recognize and address the shortcomings, but don't think of them as problems. Look at them as opportunities. It will keep you from feeling bad about all the work that will always be in front of you, and it will let you celebrate the gains you've already made. While we're on the subject of gains, let's talk about the benefits of using visual controls. The biggest reason is that visual controls reduce waste and delays, which leads to better customer service. Because of the if-then nature of visual controls, there is no need for discussion or problem solving when an abnormal condition appears. The team just follows a programmed response. That may seem to be a bit restrictive on the surface because it appears to reduce autonomy and limit creativity. Now it would be true if the team had no say at all in creating the actions, but a good, lean organization will not only include the frontline teams in the process of developing visual controls, but it will also require it. From my observations, teams with good visual controls in place seem to be happier than ones subjected to constant chaos. While I don't have any scientific data to back up that claim, I've seen it time and time again in countless work areas. Strong structure frees up teams to work on more important things, and it eliminates the repetitive problems that make many jobs frustrating. Think of how this works in the stoplight example. Having this visual control prevents a lot of waste. For example, you could be waiting forever to turn left across a busy street if there's no traffic signal there. Of course, there is a cost to stoplights, Obviously, the local government had to pay to put it there, but in addition, there are other costs. Sometimes you have to stop when the coast is clear, and there is a social cost that comes from having to teach everybody on the road the rules of controlled intersections. But overall, stoplights and other effective visual controls provide more benefit than they cost. Let's move on now and talk about the characteristics of good visual controls. Again, a visual control should be easily recognizable. Keep in mind that visual controls are generally... Thanks for watching this extended free version of our Lean Training System module video. If you want to watch the whole video, check it out at Velaction Videos. If you want to make sure you don't miss the next LTS video that we post, please be sure to subscribe down below. We also always appreciate likes as it helps us get viewed more and makes us keep adding additional content. Thanks for watching and best wishes on your continuous improvement journey.